Welcome back to Chapter 8, Estimating with Confidence. We're looking at Section 8.2. We'll do this in two videos again. We'll have a Day 1 and a Day 2 video. This is Day 1 on Estimating a Population Proportion. These are the learning objectives. After this section, you should be able to do all these things. State and check the random 10% and large count conditions for constructing a confidence interval for a population proportion. Uh, basically, this is a simple random sample. The 10% condition is the 10 times the sample size has to be less than or equal to your population. And the large counts will depend on uh, whether you're dealing with means or dealing with proportions. And in this section, we're dealing with proportions. So we'll be looking at the n times p being greater than or equal to 10 and the n times q being greater than or equal to 10. We'll determine the critical values for calculating a C% percent confidence interval for a population proportion using a table. That's table A. Okay, so we'll use table A uh, or technology. So in other words, we'll just be using our TI Inspire calculator and looking at the menus there. We'll construct and interpret a confidence interval for a population proportion. So in other words, on, we'll do it on P. And we'll determine the sample size required to obtain a C% percent confidence interval for a population portion with a specified margin of error. So again, we'll be looking and being able to solve and determine what is our best sample size. Okay, uh, here's an activity uh, that we can just kind of look at that a teacher has simulated uh, and uh, basically had a container full of different colored beads and the goal was to estimate the actual proportion, proportion of red beads in the container. So what will happen is basically one, uh, three or four teams, uh, you know, determine what's how they have a cup to use, uh, collect a sample of beads, determine a point estimate. So it'll be something like our P hat <coughs> for the unknown population proportion. We'll find a 95% confidence interval for the parameter P, and then consider the conditions uh, in order to do that, uh, make that interval, and then. That we'd obviously compare it with other teams if we did this, but we're going to cut to the chase and just look at one of those SRS uh, of beads. And this that one one sample resulted in 107 red beads and 144 beads of another color. Uh, so we got a total of 107 red, 144 other beads. So for our total of 251, our proportion, our point estimate for red beads is 107 out of 251 or as a decimal, 0.426. So we want to know how we can use this information to find a confidence interval, interval for P. Well, if the sample size is large enough that both n times P and n times Q are at least 10, the sampling distribution of P hat is approximately normal. So in other words, again, this is testing for uh, can we use the normal distribution um, and uh, testing for that to make sure. Um, we know the mean of the sampling distribution of P at should be P if you do many, 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 many samples of this. And then our standard deviation uh, is that square root of PQ over N when we do our sampling uh, distribution here. Okay. In practice, we do not know the value of P. We don't know that true population proportion. If we did, hey, we wouldn't need to do this constructive confidence interval for it. Uh, in large samples, p hat will be close to p. So our p hat, uh, we do many, many, many of those, the mean of those p hats should be close to our p. So we'll replace p with p hat in checking the normal condition because, again, we can't check uh, if we don't know what that p is. So we'll just substitute p hat in for this equation here, and thus this would be q hat as well. You know, so easily, easily substitute it in, um, again, if they're unbiased estimators. So before constructing a confidence interval for P, you should always check these important conditions. Uh, number one, check that its data come from a well-designed random sample. So in other words, check that we have an SRS. Check the 10% condition. So again, check that 10 times your sample size uh, is less than or equal to your population. That uh, helps us determine independence and also lets us know that we uh, can use the standard deviation uh, for our P hats. And then uh, check the large counts. So this helps us establish normality. Again, we'll check that. In this case, we have to check the n times p hat. Uh, 
is greater than or equal to 10, and the n times q hat is greater than or equal to 10 when we don't know the population proportion. So we can use the general formula that we have back in section 8.1 to construct a confidence interval. And remember our general form is that we have our statistic, and in this case this will be our p hat, plus or minus our critical value, uh, which we'll talk about here in a second, times our standard deviation of the statistic. And again, we'll calculate that standard deviation of the statistic the standard deviation of our p hats um, is that big square root of p, q over n. But again, when we don't know p or q, we can substitute in p hat and q hat as good unbiased estimators. <coughs> so the sample proportion p hat is the statistic we used to estimate p, as we talked about right there. And when the independent condition is met, that's when we can use this. So again, if we establish independence, we can use that standard deviation. Uh, but since we don't know p, you know, we should officially call this. This isn't the standard deviation. Uh, because we use statistics here, we use p hat and q hat, officially we should be calling this standard error uh, when we use the p hat and the q hat. Okay. So how do we find the critical value? How do we find this value in our general formula? And again, remember, this whole part here is margin of error when we put that all together. But how do we find that critical value? Well, again, if the large counts condition is met, in other words, if we've established normality, uh, to find a C confidence interval, we need to catch the central area C under the standard normal curve. So again, we have to establish normality for us to use this normal curve. <coughs> so, uh, you know, kind of just reminiscing a little bit about uh, the normal curve. Um, you know, if I want to look at this middle 95%, and that's, again, if I wanted to do a 95% confidence interval, if this is 95% confidence interval, I'd like to be all close to the middle here. I'd like to cut off these ends out here because uh, those would be the extremes. I wouldn't want those pieces out there. So I want that middle 95% to be out here or in here. 5% uh, is what I want to put on the edge. So, again, I split that 5% up and uh, two and a half percent here and two and a half percent here and uh, you know we could use uh, you know the 95 percent of the conversation is, is, is a critical value of two based on the 68 95 99 point seven rule uh, if you use table a or calculator we get a more accurate critical value so if we use actually our uh, table a and we look up this area that's from here to here you'll actually notice that we have a z of negative 1.96. Um, or if you looked up this area from all the way to from here to here and looked up 0 0.9750, uh, you'd see you have a z score of this. Um, we have this now called a z star. This is on the negative side, it's going to be negative z star. That z star uh, is just uh, what we're going to use for our critical value that we have up here. Using table A to find the critical value uh, for an 80% confidence interval, well, again, if we're trying to find 80%, I want that 80% to be here in the middle of the curve. So it means I've got 20% that I want on the outside. So again, I'd put 10% out here, and I'd put 10% out here in that shaded region uh, to create the 80%. So uh, if I'm going to use table A, uh, I could go and find the area that's closest to point one, just kind of a snapshot of the chart. I can see that uh, if I look at here, I got point one zero three, point nine eight five. They're both pretty darn close uh, to that ten percent. Uh, though what I think the point one zero zero three is the closest, so my z square would be negative one point two eight as I go through the chart and look at that. So this value here, my z star. Uh, right here is negative 1.28. The positive one up here uh, would be 1.28. Well, um, once we find the critical value, which we call z star, our confidence interval for the popular proportion p is the following. Again, our statistic plus our critical value times our standard deviation. Again, our statistic was p hat, plus or minus our critical value is at z star. That's calculated based on what uh, confidence level we have. 
And then this would be our standard error uh, because we used sample p hat uh, and sample q hat because uh, we're not given the p. Um, so uh, we're using that in substitution. So it's really not called standard deviation, it's called standard error. So when all those other conditions are met that we talked about earlier in terms of being a, from a simple random sample, we've established independence that we can use this. Uh, and that we also establish the n times p and the n times q, or n times p hat and n times q hat are both greater than equal to 10, that we can use the normal curve. Uh, this is uh, the one sample z interval for a population proportion. So, let's go back to a problem here. Suppose you took an SRS of beads from the container and got 107 red beads and 144 white beads. You want to calculate and then interpret. Again, this is stuff we always got to remember. It calculates the math part. The interpretation is the English part. A 90% confidence interval for the proportion of red beads in the container. Now, your teacher claims that 50% of the beads are red. Use your interval to comment on this claim. Well, our sample proportion, well, we did this earlier. Uh, we got 107 red beads. You got 144 white beads. Totally, that's 251. We've got 107 out of 20, 251. That is a sample proportion, a p hat of 0.426. We did check those conditions earlier that it was from an SRS that we do have uh, 10 times our sample size is less than or equal to our population, which establishes independence, and that we can use our, comp or, our standard deviation. And we also established that the n times p hat uh, is greater than or equal to 10, and our n times q hat are greater than 10 too. So uh, we can look up, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a z-score for a 90% confidence interval. So for a 90%, uh, again, what we're looking at is uh, that we have a confidence interval where 90% is in the middle, which means I've got 10% on each end. So I'm looking at a 5%. I'm looking at 5% on both both ends. Uh, so I'd have 0 0.05 here and 0 0.05 here uh, to give me that 90% in the middle. If I look up 0 0.05 into the chart, uh, kind of get stuck right between two. So we could actually go like negative 1.64, negative 1.65, so somewhere in between. So how about negative 1.645 uh, for that Z star that we got? Well, now we can put this all together into our confidence interval. Our p hat was 0.426. Our z star that we just calculated is the 1.645. There's our p hat. Our q hat, again, is calculated by going the 1 minus the p hat. And there's our sample size. And there's the margin of error here right now. That margin of error is calculated by this whole part right here. So you can either write it like this. Um, or write it as an interval. So what we say is, using the templates we had before, we are 90% confident that the interval from 0.375 to 0.477 captures the true proportion of red beads in the container. Now my teacher said that it should be 50%, and if I look at that, 50% is not within that range. And since this interval gives a range of plausible values for P, and since 0.5 is not contained in the interval, we have reason to doubt the teacher's claim. We'll finish up by just talking about the four-step process. This will be something we'll use extensively from here on out when we start uh, constructing and interpreting confidence intervals. We'll look at the four parts and we'll eventually we'll teach you a little four-part way to uh, graphically organize your problem. Uh, we'll state the problem in this box. We'll plan it here. In other words, we'll check our conditions there. Uh, we'll actually do the problem there. This is where the math gets done and this is where our conclusion will be. So just kind of giving you a little picture of what's happening uh, in the future. Okay, we'll pick up video of day two right here. See you in the next video.